afternoon. Good afternoon. How are we doing? Good. Excellent. I was uh, very honored to be part of, of this, and uh, I've always felt that uh, we all have a story in us. You know, anybody in your family? I remember years ago, um, I sat down with my mother with a little, uh, just a cassette recorder. My father had died in 1969, and he was a performer too, and I'll explain that to you if you don't know about his, his life. And I said, Ma, you know, you, we need to know the story. You were there. Ma, once you go, ain't nobody there can really tell us the story like you did. And I, I asked her just if I was not there, because I lived in Michigan now. I was living in Michigan, and I'm from New York, and she was in New York. I thought, well, just sit with the tape recorder and just talk. If I'm not there, I knew if I was not there, she would not do it as promptly. She needed a little, little nudging. But I thought if I could get her into a situation just sitting down with a tape recorder and just telling her story, because I've, I've got four sisters. I was brought up with four sisters, and um, I would sit for hours and, and hear stories that my, my mom would tell me about she and my father when they were, when they first met at 18 and 19 years old. And, um, it's just, I found it very interesting to know the history of my family or to know the history of anyone else's because it's true, we all do have a story. My first father-in-law um, was a chef and he died in his 80s, but he started cooking at the age of 14 and was in World War I. Uh, and, and, and World War II, and I, I like to talk with him about what it was like um, being a black man in the service doing all of this, doing, being a chef all around the country, places that he went. So I, I've always found it interesting to find out someone's story. And so being able to be here, I want to share with you um, my father's, part of my father's story, because it's my legacy. Um, it was a story about a, a man, an American, born in Greenville, South Carolina, in 1915, who died in 1969 in New York City. And in between those times, the life that he led, where it took him, and because he was a black man, there were a lot of things that he had to overcome. And we all know that which does not, which, that which does not take you under makes you stronger. If you have adversity, something comes into your life, and you let it get you down, it wins. But if you do not let it get you down, you are the winner. And you gain strength with that, and hopefully you pass that on to others. So my father, my mom, had a sense of themselves, a respect for themselves, knowing that before anything else, they were human. They were American and they happen to be of a darker color. They happen to have more melanin in their skin. That's the only difference that we have here, just the difference in the color of the skin. And to, uh, to tell this story is a pleasure. Um, my father, had a, his father was a minister in Greenville, South Carolina. And um, in the 19, early 1900s, and probably even to, to this day, if you are a minister in, in the South, you may not make a lot of money. So he not only was a minister, but he was also a handyman. And so he would go around with a wagon to sharpen your knives or, or anything he can do to help with things you'd use around the house, he would do that also. But uh, they were a very religious family, my, my grandparents. and. Um, I think they, 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 I know that they knew it was important for their children to learn properly because we're going to learn things from our environment and our parents, whether it be good or bad. If it's consistent, we're going to learn it. So my grandparents, my father used to tell me all the time, when my grandparents, Dennis and Elizabeth, came to dinner at home, my grandfather wore a jacket, tie, collar. My grandmother was dressed 
fully, and they would address each other as Mr. and Mrs. White at dinner with their four children. This is the way you acted. This is the way you dressed. This is the way you're supposed to be because people back then would always use anything as an excuse if you didn't speak properly. Oh, they're always like that or they always do that. Well, my grandparents felt they're not going to be able to say it about this family. We're going to show you that they're all not that stereotypical way of acting or being. And my father used to say that they could not go to the movies, they couldn't play cards, they couldn't play this little game with, with marbles. Couldn't play that either. Um, but they did sing in church a lot. And um, at the age of seven, my father was walking across the street and there was a blind a black street musician waiting to be crossed. Now, at the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, there were a lot of black um, traveling musicians who went around the country playing guitar and singing or banjo or whatever the instrument might be. They were not beggars. They were, they were instrumentalists who just traveled and played the guitar or whatever. And so when my father crossed this man across the street, the man asked my father what his name was. My father said, Joshua. And right then, the blind black street musician sang the song, Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho to my father. Um, which I guess he wanted to impress my old man, but I guess being in church, my old man knew the tune. <laughs> but anyway, he wanted to know if my father, at the age of seven, would like to lead him after work for $2 a week, or maybe three. And what that meant was, he would play guitar, my father, he would put his hand on my father's shoulder. My father would walk him to downtown Greenville, circa 1922. The man would play and sing, my father would beat the tambourine, and then he'd pass it around for money. Well, my father thought that was a great idea. But my grandmother had the final say so. <laughs> and um, being a religious person, she had to pray over it to make sure her son was doing something that would be worthy in the eyes of God. And I, I can just imagine this seven-year-old boy waiting to go to his adventure but waiting for his mother to get a message from God. <laughs> you know, I can see this little boy. Three weeks, she prayed over him. Three weeks to make sure that this was something that God would like. He was doing something in the eyes of God. She finally said yes, my father started his adventure. At the age of seven, he started leading blind man Arnold. And for the next nine and a half years, that's all my father did. He did not go to school. He just led these different men around the states. And uh, <laughs> my father said later on as, when I was grown that uh, some of these men were not totally blind. <laughs> because there were times when he would write back to his mom and if things were not particularly right, um, like when she got it, some had been scratched out, some certain lines that they didn't want her to read. Um, and there were also times when the man he was with had a good week or weekend and decided to take it off. He then would work with another blind black street musician, and he'd lend my father out. So he'd be getting some money for lending my old man out. My old man would help make money for this guy. They had a good thing going. <laughs> good thing going. Uh, by the time my father was, was 14, he was with the last blind man that he, he was leading, named Blind Joel Taggart. We're talking 1922, 1922, Blind black street musician, Joel Taggart, my father said this man owned 
three racehorses. Three racehorses. My father said it was hard to get an ice cream out of this guy. <laughs> but he had three racehorses. And by the time he got there, and they were going to record for ARC Records, that became Columbia Records later on, um, the people there had to make sure that blind Joe Taggart bought my father some long pants. Chicago can be cold in the wintertime. My father didn't have long pants or shoes because that added to, oh, give this poor kid some money. Boy, he's got those short pants and those shoes, so, you know, it helped the gig for him not to look too cool. But um, they made him give him some long pants, threatened to let the Board of Education know that my father was not going to school. And by that time, my father had learned a little bit on the guitar. Now, we had 66 different men in nine and a half years all playing an instrument. But none of them would teach him how to play. And so what he would do is whenever a blind black street musician would go off at night and do whatever a blind black street musician does without his guitar, my father would have it and would play it on their different ways of tuning the guitar. And so sometimes they, they would be in an open tuning, which I will show you later. So you learn how to play it that way, or regular tuning. And by the time he was 14, he was, he was not too bad on the guitar. And blind Joel Taggart had him lead a song, where he did the lead vocal and guitar. Um, then he went back to Chicago. I mean, went from Chicago back home to Greenville. And uh, at the age of 16, we used to have talent scouts around this country who would find new talent for the record labels. And they heard this young boy on Blind Joe Taggart's album and came to ask my grandmother if she would allow her son to come to New York City at 16 and record 28 sides for $100. Show business hasn't changed very much over the years. <laughs> but she said um, he could, but he could not, he could only sing spirituals, he could not sing the devil's music. <laughs> you see, but for nine and a half years when the father's out leading the blind black street musicians, he heard a lot of spirituals, but he also heard a lot of the devil's music. And he found that he kind of liked some of the devil's music. <laughs> so, <laughs> when he got to New York and he started recording, <coughs> something <coughs> fell, I heard it. <laughs> keep watching my back, that's all. Just keep watching my back. <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, 16, so he, um, 20, so he came, thank you, he came to New York City. And he started recording under the name of Joshua White, the singing Christian. Now, back then, they were called race records. Here's what would happen. You have a label who would go out and find black artists, bring them back and record those black artists, but only sell that music in the black area. That same label would get white artists, bring them, record them, and only sell their songs to the white area. They were called race records. So that's how my father first started singing with race records. Joshua White, the singing Christian. And he was doing quite well, actually. It was the music of the day, as it were. Um, but then, back then, on a 78 record, you could have one performer on one side and someone completely different on the other. So after a while, there would be Joshua White, the singing Christian, and sometimes on the other side, you would find this blue singer by the name of Pinewood Tom. Now where my father found that name, Pinewood Tom, I will never know. But at least he tried to respect his mother, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if he ever fooled her, but at least he, he, he did do that. Um, one of the first tunes my father wrote, not that he was a prolific writer, he was a good interpreter, but in his early years he did write, 
And this particular song was about his uncle. Now this is the South. My father's uncle had his family dynamics with his mule. Mules sometimes are hard-headed and will balk, meaning they will stop and stop pulling you. They even may sit down. So my great uncle, when his mule would stop, he had his own way of dealing with it. Now again, now these two have been together for years and years. They know each other. But he would get out of the wagon, the mule stopped. Walked over to the front of the mule, so he's looking at him right here, and just kind of about, about there. And then you would say, oh, you want me to get up now? Okay. <laughs> and they'd go on. It would happen all the time. But one day he did that. A white man was coming in his buggy. And he sees this black guy hit this mule. So he jumps out of his carriage and jumps on my great uncle's back. Now, any male, I guess, here in this room are listening, if someone jumps on your back, you do not know who they are, you just automatically defend yourself. So my great uncle turned around and knocked this white man out. It's done. It's foolish. This man just hurt him. This man just hit a white man, give it up. They put him in jail because you're crazy. You got to be crazy to hit a white man. I don't care what the excuse is, you're not supposed to do it. So, put him in jail, no trial. So, my old man wrote this song called Trouble. And though it was burned by his uncle, it really spoke of the plight of any black person south in prison in jail and call the song trouble and it goes like this it says well i've always been in trouble cause i'm a black skinned man you see i beat a white man and they locked me in the can took me to the stockade, wouldn't give me no trial, and the judge, he said, you black boy, 40 years on the hard rock pile, thought it's trouble, trouble, sure won't make me stay. Oh, 
trouble since the day I was born. Lord, it's true. Trouble sure won't make me stay. Lord, 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 it's trouble. Trouble jailbreaks do someday. City and went back to Greenville. He uh, would sing songs that were of the day and songs that he'd written. wrote this song about uh, just living the living conditions for black people back in Greenville when he came back and looked around and remembered. The song says, Well, I went down home about a year ago. Things so bad, Lord, my heart was sore. Folks had nothing. Twas a sin and a shame. Everybody said a hard time was to blame. Great God Almighty looks feeling bad. Lost everything they ever had. Great God Almighty looks feeling bad. Lost everything they ever had. Now the sun was a shining 14 days in no rain. Whole wind and planting was all in vain. They had hard, hard times. Lord, all around. Meal barrels, even crops burned to the ground. Great God Almighty, folks feeling bad. Lost everything they ever had. Great God Almighty, folks feeling bad. Lost everything they ever had. They had skinny. Looking children, bellies poking out. That old polagro without a doubt. Yet hard, hard times. Lord, all around. Meal barrels, even crops burned to the ground. Great God of my folks feeling bad. Lost everything they ever had. Great God of my folks feeling bad. Lost everything. Now your landlord comes around when your rent is due. And if you ain't got his money, he'll take your home from you. He'll take your mule and horse. He'll even take your cow. Says, get off from my land, you no good, no how. God Almighty looks feeling bad, lost everything they ever had. Great God Almighty looks feeling bad, lost everything they ever had. I make sure I keep my song straight here. But again, let me go back to his spirituals, because that's how he started. And though this was, was not one of the first spirituals he did, when I came along, you would hear him sing this song. The nice thing about it is that, you know the expression, you have to walk the walk, the walk you talk. He believed that. So when I heard him do this, I know it was not just a song to him. Song six days. I'm going 
gonna live like my sing about down in my soul. Oh yeah, in my soul, I'm gonna fight for the right, shun the wrong, shun the wrong out in my street or in my home if I have company or if I'm alone. I've got to live, live the life I sing about down in my soul. I get it in my soul. Every day, everywhere, on this busy love affair. Some folks scorn me, they look down upon me. They know church and the devil and a couple I've got to live live the life I sing about down in my soul oh yeah in my soul I say it every day Some folks scorn me, they look down upon me. Vincent, they don't like me. I don't care. You can't sing one thing. Try to live or never be a saint in your church. And the devil undercover. I've got to live. Joshua White, the single Christian. Because here's his 420. Nice, sweet little spiritual. Okay, do I do it again right in front of all these people? Damn. <laughs> Oh, rise 
see my dear old sister on her knees. We all rise together and face the rising sun. Hey, Lord. So you'd find himself, he was one of the rare, one of the few black singers in the 30s and 40s who would sing against racism. Now, everyone who was black felt it, but a lot of singers did not sing about it, and I understood why they wanted to live a long time. Uh, and you could make it questionable. But I guess my old man felt, if not me, who? If not now, when? I don't know if he sat down and thought it, thought it in that way, but that's what I got from his experiences as I look back. In the late 30s, early 30s, forgive me. By this time, my dad is living in New York. I've got my older sisters here. I think he's working on Beverly, the one right, right above me. He put together a, um, he was in a play with, Paul Robeson, um, very fine basso profundo, black actor, the singer. And um, after the play put together a group called Joshua White, the singing Christian. And um, in his group was my uncle and his brother, a man named Bayard Rustin, who became a civil rights activist years later, who helped put on the the march in Washington in 1963 with Dr. Martin Luther King, and he made sure that he invited my father to be there to sing. Um, so my old man wrote this tune about the plight of the black sharecropper in the early 30s. And if you were a sharecropper in the South, your life was not a lot of fun. You did not own the land you worked and you were give, given a smitten of what you harvested. But the difference between the black sharecropper and the white sharecropper back in that time was there was a time when black people had to pay to walk the street. Now when I found that out, and I say it, and I'll say this for the rest of my life, I, it, it's hard for, for it to come out of my mouth to know that there was a time when we had to pay to walk the street. And I do believe I heard an interview of my father at a friend's house. He was talking about it, and there was an actual, I think there was like $87 and change black people had to pay, at least in Greenville, to walk the street. You also had to pay to vote. First of all, you had to make sure, this is everywhere, make sure you were intelligent enough to vote. Once you could prove that, then you had to get a job because you had to pay to vote. And then, then we had the, for colored only, the bathrooms and, and the theaters and all that stuff. That was already implanted. But this walking tax was something. So my father wrote this song. And at the time, there was a song called Love, Oh Love, Oh Fearless Love. Love, Oh Love, Oh Fearless Love. 
love of careless love, love of oh, love of oh, careless love. Oh, see what careless love can do. Well, well, man, is thinking. I will use that melody, but I'll change the words. So when they hear it on the radio and they start to listen, I'll give them something to chew on. So, from Elman again. The song is called Southern Exposure. And it did it like this. Sometimes families would put bl the blind man up and or the, the child. Sometimes they'd have to sleep in the barn or in the fields. Um, it was this particular evening 
there was my dad and, and this blind man was sleeping in the field. My father's eight years old. My father was awakened with a hand over his mouth. It was the blind man. The blind man had heard something, wanted to know what it was, did not want my father to get wake up and make noise. <clears throat> Pardon me. So he uh, cuffed his mouth. So my father was awakened. He had to explain to this blind man what all of this noise was about. And it was about a lynching. Two black men had been caught by this group of men, women, and children. My old man said he never knew what they had done, but they were absolutely dead. And they were hanging from trees. And my father said there was a bonfire and a lot of laughing and joking and drinking. And uh, he said there were times when, during the evening, somebody would take a hot poker and get a hot wheel and burn one of these dead bodies. And this eight-year-old boy is watching this. And he and the blind man also knew that they could not move. Because if they attempted to leave, and so this blind man has everything he has of his life on him. So he's got the guitar, he's got his, his pans that he, that he will cook with, and they're all kind of clinking around on his jacket. And if you happen to get up and make that noise, there would be four people hanging from those trees. So, they just sat and waited and knew the light of day, like roaches, they go, like cowards. They knew then they could move because these people were right. But all of his life, now my sister Beverly, who was just older than me, Beverly, um, we performed with my father for 17 years. And we'd stand in the wings, waiting to be called or enjoying the show. But whenever he would do this next song, we would leave. Because it's about lynching. And we knew that every time he did it, I could see that eight-year-old boy's eyes. Whenever he did, my father died at 55, but until he died, I could always see that in his eyes, that experience. The song is called Strange Fruit. It's written by a man named Abe Maripol, a Jewish man. And I've got to do it for you. It goes like this. For the crows to plow 
for the rains to gather and for the winds to suck, for the sun to rot, for the trees to dry. City called Cafe Society, started by a man who was, was a shoe salesman. But before he started this club called Cafe Society, if people wanted to see black entertainers, they would have to go to Harlem to see them. In fact, there were some clubs in Harlem that were not for people who lived in Harlem, it was for white people who came up to see black people perform. <laughs> My choice, I'm funny. Um, but Barney Josephson brought these black performers, not just black, black and white performers, down in the village, down in the, in the lower part of Manhattan. And there you had black and white people sitting at tables together. Yet black performers and white performers sharing the stage. Like Lena Horne and Billie Holiday and my father and, and uh, Mary Lou Williams. Um, just a host of, of fine black and white performers back then. <laughs> All right, let me get to uh, my old man. In, um, in the early 1940s, my father got a chance to meet the President of the United States. But he met the President of the United States because he sang again a song against racism in the service. <laughs> That's one way to meet the President, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, my father visited my uncle, Billy, who was in the group with my dad, Fort Dix, New Jersey. My father was never in the service. He had kids, but he, he was doing a lot of benefits. So he went around to visit his brother. Fort Dix, New Jersey, goes in, sees a lot of structured buildings, and didn't see any black soldiers. Oops. Then there's some pup tents and buildings. No black soldiers. Kept on driving around the base. Finally, there was, there was just pup tents. And there, my father found all of the black soldiers. And my father thought, well, you know, maybe they're doing maneuvers or whatever they call it, and that's why they have them here. And Uncle Billy said, no, this is where we are all the time. Now, you're here, you're asking someone to go to another country and die for someone, and they treated you like this. So it wasn't anything my father, of course, was not aware of. But for, for to, to just slap you in the face, kind of. It was kind of hard. So my father went back to New York and wrote a song called Uncle Sam Says with his partner, Mr. Cooney, who was a Harlem Renaissance poet. And he recorded this song called Uncle Sam Says. And it got to the ear of somebody on the president's staff because my father got a, a call and was asked to come to the White House and sing this next song for the president and his staff. Knowing my father as I did, I am sure he sang this next song twice. Just in case. <laughs> but a friendship began between the two families that lasted through the life of Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, who died in April of 1945. In fact, that same uncle, in the late 40s, early 50s, started driving for Mrs. Roosevelt on the Billy. 
but this is the tune. You might say this is the song that brought the two White Houses together. <laughs> anyway, for my old man, his Uncle Sam says it goes like this. Let's all get together and kill Jim Crow today. 